The one thing that I think is really dangerous in many religions is that it gives people a gold-plated excuse to stop thinking. To stop thinking. To stop thinking. To say, I don't have to think about that because my religion says this is right, this is wrong, it's as clear as that, it's black and white, I don't have to think about this anymore. It's just a matter of faith. And we honor that. We say, oh, it's a matter of faith. I think we have to stop honoring people for stopping thinking. The kind of atheism that Richard and I talk about is not a complete denial of anything. It's, an, it's a question of what's likely. And, you know, we can't, I can't prove that there isn't a teapot orbiting Mars, but it's not likely. And everything we know about the universe, to, at least for Richard and I, leads us to the conclusion there's no evidence of purpose or of divine intervention. But that doesn't mean we argue definitively that we can prove that that can't be the case. So we're not denying, we're just asserting the evidence of reality. And in fact, I don't describe myself as an atheist. Uh, I have learned from my friend, again, Christopher Hitchens, I, I describe myself as an anti-theist. Namely, I cannot prove that there's no God. I just certainly wouldn't want to live in a universe with one. But if we're talking about the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, that God is standardly defined as a being who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good. And yet there is suffering in the world. How could there be suffering in the world if there were a God who knew about this suffering, had the power to prevent it, and did not prevent it? Well, Christians, of course, are not ignorant of this counter-argument, and they say many things. For example, they say, but God gave us free will. That was a great gift, worth all the suffering that occurs. But given that we have free will, he could not stop us from causing each other to suffer. Well, we might question whether the gift of free will is worth the horrendous amount of suffering that there has been in the world from, no doubt, as long as there have been beings capable of suffering. But putting that aside, it's obvious that there is suffering in the world which is not caused by free will. For example, you will all know that for about a dozen years, ending only, perhaps, was it a year or 18 months ago, Southeastern Australia had a terrible drought. And during that drought, many animals died. They died simply because the water holes dried up or they could not get enough to eat. It was not human action that caused that suffering. So there is suffering in the world which is not caused by humans, caused by earthquakes, droughts, and so on. Christians sometimes also say that suffering is the result of sin, but it's impossible to believe that a small child who is crushed by a falling building in an earthquake has sinned and therefore deserves that suffering. And of course, the animals that I've already mentioned did not sin, and yet they suffer, not only at human hands, but at the hands of, of nature. I have asked many intelligent, thoughtful Christians, and I'm asking John Lennox again tonight, to explain to me how the existence of undeserved suffering not caused by human activity could be compatible with the idea that an all-knowing God created this world, knows about the suffering, could have predicted the suffering at the time of the creation of the world, and did not change things to reduce this vast amount of suffering that goes on in the world today. It seems to me wildly implausible that this world is a world that was created by that kind of God. It seems to me much more likely that this is simply a world that has arisen through the processes of evolution that we are now increasingly familiar with, which are indeed blind and unguided, but have nevertheless thrown up beings capable of reasoning and developed capacities to understand the world and their situation because that did have survival advantages, but now can use these capacities to understand the world. That seems to me by far the more plausible picture of the world we're in than the one that theists attempt to persuade us to accept. Maybe the deepest area of conflict between science and religion, although I don't think it gets mentioned so often, and that is in the method of approach to truth. Religion largely relies on authority. It may be the authority of sacred texts, as in Sunni Islam and Protestant Christianity, or texts together with religious leaders who are divinely uh, inspired to interpret them, like Shiite Islam 
and Roman Catholicism. We don't have anything like that in the world of science. And I want to make a clear distinction. We do have heroes, as scientists we have enormous respect for. But they're not authorities to whom we go for solution of scientific problems. For example, in my field, certainly Einstein is the greatest hero of the 20th century. But no one today arguing about the theory of gravitation would settle the issue by referring back to Einstein's papers of 1915, 1916. Today, it's understood that any reasonably good graduate student understands general relativity better than Einstein did. We have learned, we have progressed, and we, so in science we don't have prophets. We have heroes, but not prophets. Another difference in the approach to truth is that we try hard in science to stamp out the influence of wishful thinking. Whereas so much of, of religious thought seems to be nothing else. Uh, I must believe in the afterlife because how could I face it if I was going to, if my life was going to terminate at death? I can understand why the notion of God has arisen and persisted, for it provides a simple purported explanation of great matters. It is a comfort blanket for the anxious and deprived, and it is a powerful weapon of control. You have a choice to accept on faith alone that there is a God and lie back luxuriating in the foam of satisfaction. There is no longer any need to think. For why pursue the incomprehensible any further than comforting assertion? Or you can take delight in the power of the collective human intellect an intellect that burrows into experiences is currently in hot pursuit of comprehension on this side of the grave and adds to life the delight of true understanding. The idea is that science doesn't have any spirituality, which of course is wrong. The reason I write books, the reason I talk about science, look at a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the 400 billion galaxies in our universe. Look out and see galaxies 10 billion light years away that may once have had civilizations around them that are living, each of them, as 100 billion stars. Look at what we learn about the universe. Look at how atoms work. Those things produce awe and wonder and mystery. The reason I'm a scientist is I love mysteries. And so to pretend that science is just dry and has no spirituality and therefore is some, somehow less significant than faith is just to misunderstand science and, and to demean it. And so the discussion we can have is how wonderful and amazing the universe is. And I think we would share in that discussion. But to condemn science as being consumerism. Look, I'm an educator. I want to educate people because I want to, them to learn about how to live a better life and how the world works and to be able to make their own decisions and to experience more joy. Because the more you understand yourselves, the more you understand nature, I think, the more enriching life is. The, the point is not to get people to believe in evolution merely for the sake of believing in evolution. The point is to get people to think rationally about the data of their senses and and to understand logical arguments and to, we, we want people to think in the style of science. The scientists are optimists. They think that given time, given collaboration, hugely important, they will arrive at explanations that do not require the insertion of words like God. God is no more than a word, frankly, which is used to disguise the inability to comprehend something. So theologians obfuscate. While theologians obfuscate, scientists illuminate. I should listen more, and I try as I get older. But thinking less is something I, I never want to do. And I do think that ultimately science is the most humble activity. Assuming the universe is made for us is not humble. Assuming that we're an insignificant bit of our marvelous universe and we make the most of it as we can is humble.